They met at the club, dancing real strong. He wanted her stuff. She said, You can't have none. He looked her in the eyes. He was super fine. And she say, okay, cute boy, my stuff is your toy. She took him home for some. They was real drunk. He snorted some coke. That's why he real broke. He couldn't get it up. So he ate her stuff. Mad in her bed, she looked at him and said, This ain't no chewing gum, this ain't no chewing gum. I had a crush on you, this ain't no chewing gum, this ain't no chewing gum, this ain't no chewing gum. I had a crush on you. This ain't no chewing gum. He couldn't concentrate. Her stuff was real stank. His tongue nice and long. He still did it wrong. Strong alcohol. Trying to get it on. She was dead wrong. The sin was real strong. He got out agitated for participating. He wanted sweet love. He wanted tasty love. Trying to hold back all up in the sack. He got out of the bed. Looked at her and said, I need some chewing gum. I need some chewing gum. I had a crush on you. I need some chewing gum. Same damn club. He was real hung, he wanted to freak, his mouth was ooey, he was dead drunk, too damn crunk, he loved to hump, he loved to hump the rump, he bought some chewing gum, he bought some chewing gum, he had a crush on you. He bought some chewing gum. Uh, this ain't no chewing gum. This ain't no chewing gum. I had a crush on you. Uh, this ain't no chewing gum. Uh, this ain't no chewing gum. This ain't no chewing gum. I had a crush on you. This ain't no chewing gum. Chewing, 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 chewing. Chewing, 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 chewing. Chewing, 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 chewing. Chewing. Chewing, 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 chewing. You chewing, 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 chewing. You chewing, 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 chewing. Chewing. This ain't no chewing gum. This ain't no chewing gum. I had a crush on you. This ain't no chewing gum. for him a date and a half. A date? Baby. Baby. Mama, it's Taiwan. Taiwan what? He missing. My cousin, Taiwan Braswell, and my nephew, K. Braswell. And y'all been the same too. Tasting, testing, caressing, messing, surrounding myself with the best of the heart. 
What is it? D? It's me. Maybe we'll catch up on the island. Please don't stop it. They think he's dead. No! Once again, here I go. Sad song I know. On my radio, I need somebody to hold. I need me a shot. I really need a shot and then I can drop it like it's hot ignorant oil supposed to warm up my soul instead I'm dying I can't stop crying You laugh at me While I drown in my misery You play with my mind Please don't stand me up this time Telling lies to me It's so obvious that you don't love me Mental reaction Physically numb To the pain you lie You fuck with my mind by and by Ignorant oil Post to warm up my soul Instead I'm dying I can't stop crying Kiki ki You laugh at me while I drown in my misery. Ignorant oil, dangers and toils. As I have to overcome Ignorant oil Got me tripping, do you know The way back to an open soul
dream Our souls were redeemed He loved me in his daydreams Our hearts grew fonder And then he, he wandered He left me alone over yonder Asshole, asshole, asshole Asshole, asshole, asshole Why you do this? To me, you wouldn't believe what that bitch said to me. She said, you are, you're needy, and do boy, you're shady, so shady, but most of all, you are stingy. With your asshole, 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 you're good and tight, asshole. I thought. We had time, impatient with the divine. Why did my asshole fuck it up? Fuck it up. Fuck it up for my soul, my soul, my soul. Asshole, asshole, asshole. Why? I wanna know why. Please tell me why. Pretty please. I scream, cherry. Ooh, them nuts, plenty of nuts, big nuts, fat nuts, chunky nuts, I am nuts, no more nuts. To me. That's how we'll always be Inseparable Just you and me It's so wonderful 
to know you'll always be around me incredible what you are to me incredible you bring out the best in me with your style of love inseparable yes we are we're like a flower to a tree like words to a melody of love there's no way we can break up no words that can make us blow our thing we're just inseparable that's how it is inseparable for the rest of our years it's so wonderful to know you'll always be around. If, 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 if I never feel you in my arms again, if I never
tender kiss again If I never hear I love you now and then Will I Hi. Hey. Hi, everyone. So uh, my mom and I were grooving through that whole thing. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank Welcome you. to Chicago. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. to the Chicago Humanities Festival. Thank you. Maybe you can tell us about this character. K. Kay. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. K. Um, I created K in 2012. Um, a, a patron, a collector, had commissioned me to do a music video for him. And so I had, I think I had previously had my character Taiwan, who you see in the Ignorant Oil video, Presumed Dead. And so he, he was intended to kind of fill that space a little bit with the character Taiwan, but not completely. Um, after I did the music video, I did a residency um, headlands in South Salido, California, and I created a feature, feature land project called Romantic Loner. Okay. And that character's theme is like the Romantic Loner, where the character Taiwan was more a masochist. Mm. And so mm. Kay is in that, that <laughs> slightly different space, but yeah. some of the songs I performed as Taiwan, I performed them as a tribute to him as the character Kay. And talk about, because there's a combination of original songs that you do, and then covers mm -hmm. that are so well selected. Um, <laughs> um, why? Why, that, why do the covers, I guess, is the real question. Uh, well, when I, in graduate school, when I was developing my thesis, I would often lip sync to other singers' music to develop my characters. And so there were songs that I would listen to to get a walk yeah. and movement down. Um, for each character. And so, my professor would always say, Kelly, you probably should sing and try to play the, those songs yourself. And wow. in school, I never would. Um, but I would write and sing with my cousins, which was something completely separate from my artwork, my visual artwork. And uh, 2000, actually in 2003, when I moved to New York, I started doing performances here and there. And like in 2006, I had a birthday party at MoMA PS1, mm -hmm. and then I debuted the song Asshole on the keyboard, just seeing how people would yes. respond to it. And then yes. my friends were like, oh, you should record an album, you should do a dance remix, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so then I, I took it more seriously and started writing and composing more songs through the characters. And so now I'm going back and covering songs that I have listened to over and over that I'm really into yeah. that fit particular characters. And it's an ongoing mixtape called Art Jobs and Lullabies where mm. I'm sampling other people's music and also doing covers, but covers that fit yes. the character narrative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was really interesting just thinking about the songs that you do, the range of songs and how much of them are about like love gone wrong. <laughs> Love and sex gone wrong. <laughs> um, but there's also a way in which even the songs that seem to be celebrating a beautiful love have this loss that's, that seems to be part of it, right? Like, yeah. the, he's the loner. Yeah. I think a part of the raunching this comes from, I grew up listening to Millie Jackson, because, like, my aunts. And so I was always amazed at how strong her voice was. And then, like, she was like a on Gladys Knight level, but, you know, but when you would listen to her live CDs and her albums, like, she would get, like, really, really, really raunchy. And so I, and I also grew up watching Dev Comedy Jam, so I try to incorporate that sort of, um, 
comedic aspect of it. But I also grew up watching soap operas, and I was also like a sensitive child, so I do have, so I am like directly in touch with my emotional side. Um, and so I'm able to pour, like pour that aspect. And I grew up singing in the church, so you know you had to like be coming with a feeling Absolutely. of some sort, or it'll just fall flat on the audience and nobody's moved by it. So you always had to put yourself in a space of being like humble and kind of vulnerable in a sense. And you learn that in theater. Yes, yes. As well, to just kind of give yourself over. Right, so when you're giving yourself over, because the emotional dimension when you're singing up here is just, it's totally there. And then for it to work also as a kind of, I don't know, a comic, in a comic mode, and parody means that you can't like start cracking up no, no, it, while you're, you know, you know, really emoting through the song. So I wonder how you manage that, that balance between, you know, the comic dimension of it, but then also the, the feeling, the emotional part. If you weren't listening to the words, it would I, seem like it's a straight, it's a straight performance. Yeah, I think like I, I mean, I sometimes it's going back and like conjuring, conjuring up like forms and emotion, but like kind of following my imagine, like imagination. But there is a place in me that could be kind of emotional, and I don't want to say like sad, sad, but it's just this, it's this. I feel like it's a tragic part of my personality that probably came from like my upbringing, but and the, the humor, like one example is like when my grandmother passed away, because people in my family are naturally funny. Um, you know, people like crying, but then one of my aunts started telling a story about my grandmother, then people went from crying to like cracking up laughing. Yes. And so it's something, I don't know, it's something about when something is so tragic and sad that it almost pushes you into a place kind of have to laugh, yes. like laugh at it. Right. And so sometimes like with, with the, the inseparable video, like I knew that was, you know, could, could read as funny or corny to some people or, or whatnot. Or, you know, I shot it in Miami, so it's like telenovela land and I do reference to soap operas. And so it's like this character texting and he's having this romantic affair mostly through his phone. And then all of a sudden he gets a text and like the person not showing up. And so it's like making sure a punchline or something yeah, yeah. comedic happens somewhere in the storyline where, it, where it, the, the funny part will resonate. And so for that particular video, I thought that should happen yeah. like at the end. Um, like with the song Asshole, I was thinking about it in terms of spirituality, but also f the physicality sure. <laughs> and also figurative. Yes. So the song was written where you get these three different types of references yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. in your mind. And so it starts off emotional, but then the punchline comes in and then it kind of continues. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's making sure like the humor is in the narrative and the language, yeah. language somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like the song Ignorant or like Kiki Ki, you laugh at me while I drown in my misery. I mean, have like, say somebody slip and fall, mm -hmm and hurt their back, well, most people want to laugh yes. <laughs> when that happens, but then you want to go make sure That's the person is okay. So it's like the tension between this fun is not funny. Absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. And the way, I mean, there's classic theories of humor that talk about that. And when you were talking about that line between, you know, when you're laughing at a funeral, let's say, because you're remembering positive yeah, things yeah. about the person. Yeah. Um, you really made film. me think about Tyler Perry, mm -hmm. right? And the way that his films move back and forth from like the most ridiculous kind of trauma to something that's highly comic. And you're saying it's like, you know, related to your own family, but it seems like that's actually kind of like part of black vernacular yeah. expression. Yeah, I think so. also like even with like Shakespeare, like the tragedy and comedy, like yeah. the format, like in a, in a comedic setup, normally the tragedy happens right at the beginning and then, the character is always trying to get over this like mm. most tragic, ridiculous thing that happens, and then like the drama, like the characters like called to like some type of order, and then they have to go through this like emotional, yes. like transition. We were talking earlier about like Joseph Campbell Hero's journey. Like a lot of that I mm -hmm. study in terms of like narrative and, and like different plot points, and so I think. 
just like the, the structure of comedy and drama is like, you know, slightly different. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but very relative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like they have like the same elements, but right. it's like in the order that they happen. Because I was going to say, like, some of it like, could be like slapstick, and then, but that's when you're pushing something like so, so, so ridiculous. And, that's, and I think that's what we get into the stereotype sort of things, which I've consciously played with, but I always try to like add dimensions where there's a tension between the stereotype and like the archetype. Uh -huh. um, of the of what the character represents. Right. Yeah. Could you talk more about stereotype? Like, what stereotypes do you feel you're engaging with? What are sometimes some of the stereotypical um, perspectives that people bring to your work? Mm -hmm. Well, I for from when, early on when I was developing my thesis work, which a lot of this work come out of, I thinking of the character Taiwan. He was like the feminine gay character, just flamey, flamboyant. And then I thought about that in the context of, context of stereotyping, like what could make this character well-rounded? So like I made him a singer, and I made him mostly talk about religion and spirituality and sing songs where he could become, I don't say the stereotypical singer, but like an archetype, the, the Santris, the, what do you call it, Santris? Yeah, like the sing the Santris, like the, the singer type. And so it was it was like looking at Gogon paintings and then looking at like Billie Holiday and like adding all of that into the stereotypical thing of a feminine yes. gay character and then just having it layer where it becomes like something different, but also have the character have the outrageous mm -hmm. situations that happen, like the boyfriend's calling, he's coming and you upset and blah 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 blah. And you're seeing this song and it's like over the top, dramatic, dramatic. And just having that be within all of that. But then at the same time, you may be thinking of uh, the archetype of R&B soul singer. And, um, so that was, that was one, one way. And then, I, you don't, and then you see like the mothers and the parents. And like, you know, like a lot of the... In, like in the latest piece I did, I, I, I included characters I played from 2002 up until now, and so it ended up being, I ended up playing 30, like from that time, and I took like childhood photos and, and made them like male and female for like five of the, the childhood characters. And so I would, I, I mean, a lot of it comes from me, like, thinking about my relationship with, in my family. So there are some things I share with the characters that are obvious, and then there are other things, like, that are not obvious. Like, yeah. I would talk about the mother characters, but clearly, I'm not a mother, but <laughs> I got stories from, like, my aunt and uncles that helped me identify. You know, and the older I get, I identify more and more, especially with the male figures, but with the females, like, aunts, they would tell me stories and somehow I can identify with those things. So that's how I'm able to channel like the female characters, but try not have it be like the stereo stereotypical thing and making sure there are things there that layer the character and make, the, make you care for the character and just like let the character off, right. sort of, or write the character off. Right. Yeah. And so each one is like different, like there is a fashion designer who's the one, the Afro, like his mother is a fashion designer, but that's a character I haven't been able to explore in the storyline, but you see her in the collages. She has like the wrap and the skirt pulled up. Um, she has a gray, a gray wig, but on a gray <laughs> um, sometimes the gray and blonde wigs read the same. So that's like another thing that could cause it different with people. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you like style your characters. And I guess I mean both in terms of what they look like, but the important point you just made where something that you might choose as part of what they're wearing will read in a certain way when you make it into a, a video piece. Mm -hmm. 
So could you just talk about like your process when you're developing a character, when you're thinking about language, you're looking, thinking about the look of the characters? How do you, how, what's that process like for you? Um, some, sometimes it starts off with, with just a name or a personality of the character. Um, I often go to thrift stores, I go to wig stores. Um, sometimes it's just walking around with one or two characters in my head and like trying on a wig and like, mm, no, mm, yeah, mm. Okay, maybe. And then I don't know, like when I put the wig on, like, it's just a moment that happens and I'm like, okay, this is the character. And then from there, it's like, okay, do I go to the thrift store? Do I go to the 99 cent store? Do I contact a fashion designer to see if they, you know, That's would... a big range, right? Like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's just thinking about, you know, who the character is and how I would be comfortable in that particular movement and and so that's the process of like going to just going but not trying to do 10 at one time it's like one or two at a time and then i kind of get in the car and sometimes i take friends with me and then if i like over the summer when i was wrapping up the the character tree i had one of my assistants with me and sometimes it's kismet because we I, we were looking for the Florida Mama Rose character for, you know, and we went in the store and she came to me like, oh my gosh, look what I found. And she found this gown with roses on it. And so sometimes it just happens yes. like that, yeah, where you just kind of go with it and just trust yes, the that. Yes, come to you, yeah. 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 So. yeah, yeah. So I'm sure you guys have questions Thoughts? There's a microphone here, so if you have a question for Caleb, just raise your hand. There's the lights. Hi. Hello. Uh, so my question is, how much of your own identity do you put into your work? Um, how, I would say each, each character has an element of myself. Like with the character t with Taiwan, I, I do share the sexuality of the character. I feel like when I created him, I was looking to have a voice through him. Um, so the feeling is that I have been through you know, challenging things in my life. Um, but I don't try to retell my you know, particular like life story back to back. And so with him, that that was my identity with him. With Kay, I feel like Kay is closer to my personality, but I'm, you know, I'm making up narratives with this, you know, with some of my experiences through the character, because I feel like there are things that I can express almost at like a heightened level than, than my you know, own life. So I do feel like with those two, I'm like really like close, close to them. Um, and some of them are just like imaginations or it's like something that happened and then you might get a verse for a song, but then you need to add some other stuff to it to kind of round it out. So it's, <laughs> So I want to, so like, again, like I tell people, if I told you it was autobiographical, I'll be lying. If I told you it wasn't some truth in it, I'll be lying <laughs> as well. So I was, so I'm there, but I don't know the percentage. Because sometimes, sometimes it's what the story needs. Like, if you have these characters and you're like, well, where are their parents? You know, and like, I was raised by I was raised by my grandmother and my aunt and uncles, and then my mother wasn't around. And my grandmother was actually deaf, and so all my characters do is talk on the telephone, but it's probably something there subconsciously about me spending a lot of time with my grandmother, who was deaf, who watched soap operas. She wasn't always deaf, but because I think I couldn't always have a conversation with her, I might have been focused on visuals and the television a little bit more and but was just all was just curious like she just kept living you know either even without her hearing but a lot of work takes place on the telephone but because people were like oh you're playing your grandmother and I was like well actually 
the version of my grandmother that I knew was deaf. It might have not been the version like some of my older cousins or my aunt and uncles knew, but and so I think subconsciously that that relates to, to. Could you talk a little bit about the river video that that you showed, how you choreographed it, and why you chose the location, and what you were maybe trying to say? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the river video, that's that's not. I just recently started performing the song "Asshole" to that song, um, only because I thought it would create like like some you know like emotional experience like someone abandoning you and you're in the trouble waters like that sort of thing but I actually I actually was shooting the first video suit one for art jobs and lullabies and I had just shot this video lonely this was at Vermont studios in Vermont I was doing a residency I was there I was there for a week and so I shoot this one video, so then I was like, oh, I want to shoot a video out there in the ward. And it's like, Caleb, you should go to the other end because there's people riff-raff, you know, in, in there during the summer. And I was like, no, I'm going to go out and get this one shot for this music video. And then I'm just, you know, and so we set up the shot. I go out there, it's 40 degrees, and I actually slip in the water and fall. And so, like, I slip on in the water, and then I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, what is like happening and so I literally thought for a split second that I was like leaving here and so then I get up and so they were like Caleb can't you swim I was like well I have asthma like I can't just like and I was like if I if I slip again then I'm like gone for real you know so meanwhile the camera is way off so they was like so people was coming to rescue me but the people in the office thought we were choreographing choreographing a video. So they were looking out the window and they thought everybody that was doing their role was performing. And so then, so they pulled me out, then the ambulance come, and then they checked me for hyperthermia and, you know, this and that and other. And so, I don't know, so then when I, like weeks later, like, I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do with this footage? Like, I definitely, the song was called So Cool, and I was like, I definitely don't want to sing the song or put this, put this um, video to this. So I listened to other songs on the CD that, that fit with it. So I just let the song play. So when you watch the regular video suit, you'll get a performative video, and then you'll get that video, and then the performance continues. So I, so I kind of put like different songs over that footage, but it's sort of like a, what do you call it? Like an a inter, inter, a intervention or like, you know, something like intervenes. And it's only, it was just kind of to break up like the performance and like how sometimes real life moments happen. And so I literally had to go get care another wig. I think that wig that I had on is probably still in the water. <laughs> um, and then I, then, then I get an interview from New York Magazine. And so then I'm looking at the footage. And so then I'm like, is that an orb? I don't know if it's an orb or not or what it was, but I started zooming in on it because it was like weeks later. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what was that in the camera? And I was like, well, maybe somebody was watching over me that day because I had no business out there trying to shoot a video in 40 degrees with asthma on like a waterfall because I thought it was pretty. And so that's literally, so I just incorporate that just like one of those, see, like, it wasn't funny when that was happening to me, but it's funny now, like, looking back, because, I mean, I even laughed, and like, Kayla, what in the world? Because we see like, you standing you, here singing, yeah. so we know you make it. <laughs> so I'm like, what were you thinking? Like, I'm, and, and I went to Miami, and they were, like, trying to get me to go kayaking, and, like, like I wouldn't even go. I was like, no, like, I've had experience with slip-up. Like, it'll be a while before I can just, yeah, get in the water to that extent. Like, so, and that's what happened. So I just put, performed that song over it to kind of represent something going wrong. And so then I, I ended with Inseparable, like, live kind of went on, like, after that moment. Uh, please tell us if you had anything to do with the art in the room with the dollar bills and, and that sculpture coming at you. Uh, I was in Miami doing a residency at the Fountainhead, and we actually had a computer theft. Somebody, the night of the Super Bowl, 
like the next morning, someone broke into the residency and stole my computer. So, and I was gonna do like a different project while I was there. And so I was left with my old computer. And so I was like, oh, why don't I just get some, you know, find some karaoke tracks and record the songs. And so discussing the people who own the residency had this house across the street, but because I, I didn't go to one of the open studios we had one day, I didn't realize it was there. And so another artist was like, oh, Caleb, um, yeah, they do such and such over there. So I had already recorded the song, Breathe Again, and then I walk in this house, and it's like all these art installations. And it just fit like, it just, it was one of those moments when it just fell into place. But it wasn't my art, it was other artists from Miami. And I was like, I think this worked with the song perfectly. And so we went in and set up the shots and just shot it. And so I just, yeah. So it was like, I was like, oh, here's my set. <laughs> that was built for me like six months before my arrival. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they did something at Art Basel with a space and they just left it up because the house is being torn down. So their artist brother owns the house and he had a free studio in there and then they just had, the, had art installations in the house. They were going to tear it down. I don't know if they tore it down yet, but it's getting torn down. And so, just... <laughs> okay. Uh, the phone that you used most of your production, do you see it as a friend or an enemy? Or does that kind of bounce back and forth? I think at, at, at first it was like just this communicative device, but now it's like, I realize like most people relationships happen on, with this device, a, a big chunk of the relationships. And so I think it can be an enemy and a friend, but it's almost how you perceive it. Because it's like sometimes I realize I probably read some messages with too much emotion <laughs> versus when it was probably just something somebody was saying like really light. So I think it could be both. But I do feel like it's just not just this thing where you just pick up and call somebody. Like now it's like this device like with social media is just like it means so much more and, and I don't I don't think it's always a good thing that everything happens through through the device. It's also cool how it becomes part of your performance. Like in the breathe again you're kinda of tapping the phone. <laughs> that it becomes an extension of the body in so many ways. Too. Well I find myself like by myself a lot just doing emails and looking at social media and just like and it's like oh my gosh like could I see like a real human? Because as an artist like when you're in a singular practice, yeah. like you're in your studio all the time, and so yeah. it's like, okay. It definitely amplifies that sense of loneliness, lonesomeness yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. Other questions? We have time for just one more. <laughs> so what are you working on now? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm actually I'm teaching at SBA in the fall, and I'm working on a, a 10 episode comedy series with James Franco, where we're gonna play different characters. We're gonna shoot sometimes this summer, and it'll probably be ready like the end of the year. And so those are the main two things, teaching and uh, a, a new comedy short series. Um, and that's, 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 yeah, that's the main thing right, right now. Thank you so Thank much you. for being with us today. This is really wonderful. Cool. Cool. Thank you.